Oh, Shalom. I want you to hear something. It's from a... When are you going to start making a plan about what God is offering you in exchange for your petition? What do you think you will gain? Use your head. Use your brain. From a, from a vid called uh, Khazarian Conspiracy. Um, and even the righteous Gentiles that have faith in, in, in Jah word, whether they fully accept uh, the humanity of our black Lord and Savior, I guess it's an individual, so, you know, it's an individual thing. You know, depends. Some might be open to it. If Jesus is black, they will accept it. There's some Gentiles who who have faith in the Almighty and know the truth of life, that they may not be, um, how can you say, have all the information that Christ is black, as we say, or Ethiopian, like Ethiopian Hebrew, but that they don't resist that as being a, a, a reality, you know. Therefore, we call them the righteous, you know, they are of the righteous uh, uh, Gentiles, and you can see the fruit, you can see their faith by their work. The particular lady uh, that said that, um, you know, caught my attention was at the end of actually the video, but the video is interesting because it speaks about, you know, the other Jews or Revelation um, 2 and 9 and Revelation 3 and 9 uh, Jews, what we call the OJs. And I think what really caught my attention was the first part of what she said, when she said, um, she said, uh, start, you know, starting your own nation. Let's go over again. And she said, she said, hear it again. When are you going to start making a plan about what God is offering you in exchange for your petition? Okay, pause it right there. She said, when are you going to start making your plans around what God is offering you? for your petitions. And then the secondary point that she made a little bit further on in the vid is about starting your own nation. You know, looking at this present um, Gentile, the end of the Gentile world dominion and the whole old world order, new world order, this, that whole mumbo jumbo, she just breaks, you know, she breaks it down very, very plainly and simply. You understand that when you're in an unrighteous situation like Look at look at look at the Bible for a moment. Abraham was in a certain place. He was told to come out, right? The Israelites, uh, the Hebrews, were in a state of bondage, and they were told to come out. The Revelation speaks to us, and it says to come out of Babylon, my people. And now we understand that it's not just the the the, the physical coming out of so-called one country and going into another in this present dispensation, because this is global. But firstly and foremostly, wherever you're at, is to come out of false religions and stop worshiping false gods or, or the true God that has been falsified by the Gentile conspiracy, by the, by the demonic powers that, that, that move men and people to do the evil that they do in Jah name or in God's name or using God or even the Bible as a as an excuse or a reason. But she said, When are you going to make your plans? And when I heard that I said, Wow, that I need to say that to my people. You know, someone needs to say that to to, to this lost people and to our people and to you all. When are we gonna make our plans around 
what Jah is 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 offering us. You understand? In exchange or due to or because of the petitions that we make. You know, when when we when we say the our father prayer, do we pay attention to what we're saying? Or we say the our father, you understand, who art in heaven. You understand? Know Hallow or holy be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy what will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. But see, counterfeit, the, the counterfeit form of Christianity tells you, don't worry about it. You know, pay your taxes. Abide by the Gentile world powers and rulers. Like give unto Caesar. You understand? Know and, and take from God, give unto Caesar, and it'll be all right after you die. And Bob Marley and the Whalers, uh, Tosh as well, you know, he said some people think, you know, great God is coming from the, you know, from the sky, take away everything and make everybody feel high. But if you know what, 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 what life is worth, if you really know what life is worth, you will look for and seek to bring the kingdom of God that reality to earth, and you must start with yourself. You must start with your own heart and with your own mind. Now, I, I preface this, um, this, this week's Torah portion, reading and feeding, and let us get the, um, this is for the, for the Rastafari Book Club. You understand? We have another, another edition. I think we pointed it out before, or perhaps we didn't. Um, this is Vayikra. You understand? Know Vayikra, Vayikra, and this is the Hebrew book of Leviticus. You understand? Know Which is uh, the third um, Torah portion. This is the third Torah portion. You can see it right there, volume three, Torah portion, volume three. So we've already gone through two former portions. The first portion, um, Barashit, or Barashit, Barashit, which is. Um, Genesis, the Hebrew Genesis, Shemot, which is the Hebrew Exodus, and now we're in Leviticus. You know what I'm saying? And I call this the after the golden calf apostasy. You see, after the golden calf apostasy. And it was after the people got impatient and went back to their old ways, you know, while they waited for Moses to come back from the mountain, they got very impatient, and they started to go back to their old, their old forms of religion. And what's interesting for we who are um, Ethiopian, Hebraic, and in and, 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 um, spirit and in truth, we can see that very same process happening to us over the past 40 years because different scholars might give a time period of when the golden calf incident basically happened. But this book, which is Leviticus, actually shows how a priesthood made of one tribe, one particular tribe, would represent the Beit Israel, would represent the whole people before God because the people as a whole were to be, in John's own plan, a nation of the priesthood. That means if, if the people were faithful and, and were true to their word, they would not be, in a sense, a Leviticus. You know, they would not be um, Leviticus because the whole people would be a nation of the priesthood. But because of the golden calf incident, a particular portion of the people which had remained faithful while the majority of the people went back to the, the cast out forms of worship, like the, like the old shit that people were doing back in Egypt. This is similar to, I, I like to liken it to this. It's like after finding out that Jesus is black and finding out about the Ethiopians and finding out about who we are, and, and we come out, and we're going through this desert experience that ones will become impatient, and they will go back kind of like to the storefront churches, to the white Jesus, to the, to the prosperity pimps and preachers. It's similar to that. Wouldn't that be a going backward and not forward? 
I mean, I want to say more on that, but um, let's get into this Torah portion reading. I began off with that clip right there because in that small clip, you know, when, you know, that's the question. When are we going to make our plans around being Beta Israel, about being Ethiopian Hebrews? You know, um, on one level, one can say, okay, it's not saying that we've learned enough that we don't have to learn anymore, but it's really saying when are we going to act, in other words, when are we going to act and, 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 and become willing in, in spirit and in truth, in, 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 in heart and in mind to act on it, to act on it. That's the real question, Raytheon. And then the secondary point about building our own nation. Why are the people going down to D.C. right now with the tra Trayvon Martin, um, the murder, and we, we view it as a murder, um, as uh, racially, of course, it's racially motivated. Um, and I think there's a real teachable moment in that. Now everyone is saying, well, what's the, the race of... Um, you know, the race of the of the killer, of the murderer, of, of, of Zimmerman, that he's not really white, his father's white, and his mother's Hispanic. But coming from a, a black Hebrew Israelite perspective, um, based on teaching, you are basically of the tribe that your father is, in, in, a, in a sense. And here is what, unless one breaks that cord, spiritually speaking, it's like when Josh says in the, the Ten Commandments, it says, um, to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. So if one continues in the, the, the way of their ancestors, and if their ancestors were unrighteous and were ungodly, and from John's righteous viewpoint or point of view, were, were wicked or were criminal or were reprobate. And you as a child saying, well, listen, I'm just a child. I don't have nothing to do with them. But you would have to separate yourself. You have to separate. If you continue to go and say, oh, I'm just honoring my, my, my mama and my papa, right, as many people say. I'm, I'm honoring my But if your mama and your papa is not honoring John, Think about the, you know, think about the, 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 the situation you're in. And then think about it more so. The whole idea to honor your mother and father, your father, originally was father and mother. In Leviticus, it becomes mother and father, which is some interesting reasons um, we uh, propose behind that. That comes from the Almighty. It's the Almighty. It's Jah who says to honor them. So if we look in society today, we say, how come the youths are not honoring the parents? So for some, because society has cast God out, has cast Jah out. In such a society that is, first of all, built on bloodshed, it's built on slavery, it's built on lies, it's built on corruption, cannot have, to put it mildly, an easy landing. It cannot. It, Basically, it has to crash and burn. So within the available time that we have, brothers and sisters, we need to set our hearts and minds to, to make our plans around those petitions that we offer. If we are, if we are faithful, if we, if we do um, praise Jah and we do pray to Jah and we do um, give thanks to him and study and read his word and we, we, we know what pleases him, and it pleases him even to be, get it in your heart and your mind, even if your physical, financial, or otherwise circumstance might prevent immediately acting on what you have planned. You have to begin by getting it in your heart and your mind and, and to set your prayers around that and your will, you understand, to, to set your will to obedience, that's the key, to, to, to hearing and to obeying. Now, with that particular matter said, I, I just want to share that, you know, perhaps I'll, 
I'll, I'll pause this and just make this, um, uh, you know, a preview to setting up our own nation. Because we are a people. You understand? We are a sovereign people. And this kind of reminds me of another subject matter we wanted to get into. And perhaps we'll, we'll pause on the Torah portion reading and feeding, which for this, for this particular week is some basics that carry on from last week. But since uh, Fasica or Pesach, since Pesach is coming up, the, the Master's evening meal or the Last Supper, we want to um, help to prepare those of our brothers and sisters, wherever you're at, with some of the basics, how you too, you and your family, or even if one is by themselves, you know, if it comes down to that, you ne you're never alone. John has already said that. Joshua has already said he'll be with us even to the end of the world. And although we may say that the world is ending, it has not completely ended, so... Jah will be there. So we want to touch on a couple of things concerning like the name change for a moment. Because um, these are things that you need to have on your list. Um, the name change, the prerequisites. Uh, here we have some of the prerequisites uh, for the name change. Some matters about the name change. And the name change is very, very important. And... Um, I know we had touched on it previously, but the other day we had, the Spirit had given us uh, inspiration to write down some basic, some basic to-dos, some basic to-dos right here. And let's see if we can bring this up for you and share this and share this, uh, share this with you. Um, so one, two, uh, three, four. Mm. All right, uh, name change. Okay, if it's not here in a couple of the pages, I'll take a pause. I'll find it and um, bring it forward to you. Okay, okay it might not be in, in here. Or maybe I'm going a little bit fast. I want to share this with you. But it, it's time for us to set up our own our own, when we say our own nation, see, some people get a whole bunch of the different ideas. First of all, it's to understand Jah's vision. That's the first thing we have to do. We have to understand the Almighty vision. Because the Almighty has a vision. See, He sees us a certain way, just like the world sees us a different way. And we're, we're, we're complaining, why the world sees us like that, and they need to do this and that, but we need to focus on how Jah sees us. And he's to and he's to please, please Jah according to what, how he sees us, and that's okay. Here we, actually it was it was right in front of us, but some of the other notes must have threw us off. So there was a name change, and then we had um some about name change um prerequisites because some prerequisites first of all is finding a good name. So let's call this um Rastafari name change and and our real ID. So. Let's call this Rastafari. Right, Rastafari name. See, and a lot of people won't understand. You know, there's a lot of folks, they may be friends, family, they may they may mean well. You understand? But they really don't understand. And so it's Rastafari name change. Alright, and Real ID. Now you might have heard of real ID elsewhere, right? Name change, real ID. Because you have to understand that the, the the name that most Americans or most who are born in the West, especially us as the ones who lost but now found Beta Israel, these names that we have, first of all, are not our own. The names that we carry, even these these um, Slave master's last name, because we was on the same plantation, so we get that name, that's the plantation. So it's like we still are their property. See, people don't understand the significance of it. Why do you think that one of the first things that the Almighty did with our ancestors in their situation was to change their names? 
I mean, we can point to a lot of uh, cases, cases in point. Even the Savior is known as Jesus or Joshua, Yeshua, but also as Emmanuel. You understand? As Emmanuel. Now, this is what's kind of very um, interesting in a sense, that he's known as Emmanuel, yet most cannot find anywhere where he is called besides saying that he is a Emmanuel. So that means he also has another name. But his situation, of course, is much different than our situation. That's why he is our Savior, our black Lord and Savior, and we are not his, all right? We're not his Savior. We're his people. Now, as far as the name change, right, the name change and the real ID, first of all, is to find a good name. The first thing is to find a good name. Well, the first thing is really to know who you are. But anyone who is even interested in the Rastafari name change, you know, must understand that. Because you cannot say, okay, I'm going to um, make my plans around my petitions to the Almighty, and I am going to come out and set up a new nation and work with others cooperatively outside of this paradigm and then drag that garbage along with you. What garbage? The Babylonian names. You know what I'm saying? The Babylonian surnames. Some folks might have been given a, a Bible name, you know, even in English. So that name change would be to a more accurate and appropriate pronunciation, the Royal Amharic. So the name would change in its spelling and pronunciation, but it's already a good name because it's a biblical name. You understand? And when you recognize, well, who you are and who we are as a once lost but now found out, some folks, even some of your family folks may not accept this. This is one thing you have to recognize because um, different spirits are different. You know, you have to also remember that um, some of them choose not to accept the truth. But if you are an adult, if you are of sound mind and sound reasoning, and I say that because um, this message is going out to many folks, and many people might take it to certain extremes, um, moderation in all things, you know, and because of a particular, a particular um, student, I, I thought about this for a while. This is one of the reasons why. I, I might not have posted anything about the name change and some other things. Some people took it to some extremes, though that might have been an individual case. It just reminds me to remind you of what we should all be reminded of, of moderation. You understand? Of moderation. Um, now, the name change. Let's get into the name change for, for, for a moment. There's a couple of basic things that ones um, need um, to do especially in this particular time. The first is, is once you find that good name, you know what I'm saying, once you find that good name, the proper pronunciation, so forth and so on, um, let's put name change right here, the name. But see, the name comes in two parts. The name comes in a first name, right, a first name, and then comes in a what they call a last name. For us, the last name is the family name, or sometimes they call it, a sir, right, name. Now, sir is like saying Mr. In that sense, it's a, it's a title name, like a family name, a title name. Now, this is interesting because most African Americans and blacks in the West who are uh, descendants of the trans-Ethiopic Ocean or Atlantic Ocean slave trade, they are carrying slave masters' surnames around, even to this very day and time, are you going to tell me that that does not have any effect on you? You are, you are consciously identifying yourself as property of Masa. Now, let's look at a couple of other um, spiritual disciplines or religions or people that have a spirituality or religion that um, informs them, instructs them, and, and guides them. Let's look at, um, well, Jewish people. We already know that they, they, they are proud, even, even though they might not actually be Semitic, 
but they adopt clearly Hebrew names unless they are going into show business and then they get some other names, so forth and so on. But I think a better example would be even the Muslims for a moment, because we have a lot of our so-called black folks who gravitate to Islam and become Islamic. We know about the nation of Islam. The nation of Islam, where they adopted the X, basically the X. So the surname basically became an X. Why an X? Well, X is an unknown quotient. Quotient. You know what I'm saying? What is the X? They said, well, we don't really know who we are. I mean, we are the, we are the lost tribe of Shabazz. But see, we are the lost tribe of the house of Israel. So a, a general surname, a general surname would be Israel. That's a general surname. You know what I'm saying? A general surname. You know, because you could change your name as many times as you like until you get it right. You know, this is your right. See, a lot of folks don't even, you know, we, we like to look at other folks, you know, even the Europeans and the actors and other folks out there. And in these studies, we've come across a lot of different type of interesting information and find out that some of these other folks be changing their names whenever they feel necessary and have changed the name several times until they, quote, got it right or until they were comfortable. At a general level, like we're saying, Israel, you understand, because this is our father's house in that general sense as the, as the lost sheep, right, of the house of, you see, as the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Israel as a general surname. Now for us as Rastafari, you understand, and in this society, and even I, myself, we took the name of our sir, the, one, the Adoni, the master of the house, because we belong to his house, and that last name, you understand, is Tafari. Right? Is Tafari as our sir name. So, some would say, well, which one should I? Well, which one do you identify with more? Actually, there's... We know that Tafari represents, he's the king of, the true king of Israel. You know what I'm saying? The conquering line of the tribe of Judah. We do not choose Selassie as a surname because Selassie is, is, is the Hila Selassie is a compound name. It's like the name Israel. It's like the name Israel. Isra is part one and El is part two. You see, and to take Salase as our last name, unless it is our baptismal name. But I would suggest don't wait until you so-called get baptized. Start to make these steps, you know, start to make these steps as soon as possible. And people ask, well, what about my family, my children? So whoever is under your authority, if you share that authority with others, well, of course, you, you need to consult others, like husband and wife, if there's a, if there's a husband that want to do it, but the wife is still a little bit iffy. Well, the husband can still do it for his own name, as the wife can do it for her own name. And, you know, they can still pray and try to, and try to reason with the spouse that is, as the Bible says, with the unbelieving, you understand, um, element, and with prayer and faith and good works. You understand? Know Hopefully, Yah will will it to pass and ones will be able to see eye to eye. There's no guarantee on that. You know what I mean? There's no particular easy, easy road. And this, the reason why I answer like this is because there have been some questions on this since we first announced the name change, so forth and so on. And you can go to our website. There's more information there where we will give certain consultation towards that particular process as well as help ones navigate some of the basic some of the basic legalities. But it's in your rights. Nothing says that you have to carry slave master's name for a thousand generations. That is just foolish and ridiculousness, especially if you acknowledge, you know what I'm saying, if you acknowledge who you really are, if you if you know the half of the story, 
that the Gentile world doesn't tell you and really doesn't want you to know but cannot prevent you from knowing or acting on it. So this is the first step with us is, is finding that good name, you understand, or finding a name, you understand, or finding out whether the name you have is biblical. You see, some folks have a name that's biblical, but they don't know the Bible. So it might be pronounced like this in English, but actually is like that in the royal Amharic language of the King of Kings and his Christ. This is where um, we have put ourselves forward to, you know, make time and to give certain counsel and basic counsel and basic advice towards. Um, now, the first name, like we said, the, the first name. Now, the last name situation is basically either or. Basically, it's basically either or. It's basically one chooses Israel, you understand, as their, as their last name, which is the general, the general of, of our people, you understand. We are Israelites. We are the once lost but now found sheep of the Beta Israel, the house of Israel. As you already know, the Bible says in my father's house, there are many mansions. So we as elect Rastafari, we hold to the Ethiopian Hebrew, you understand, to the Ethiopian Hebrew interpretation of who we are and to other Ethiopian Hebrews before us, like Rabbi Wentworth Arthur Matthews of the um, Commandment Keepers Congregation, others who might be um, Hebrew Israelites or some might be black Jews or African Israelites. Like we said, in my father's house, in our father's house, there are many mansions, but this is the advice and instruction in our mansion of our father's house. It's Rael as a general qualified, because there may be some who don't reject his imperial majesty, but are not, do not feel themselves of the election to take on Tafari and might be more comfortable with Israel as their surname. So be it. According to the scriptures, according to the truth, it is, it is within Jah law. You understand? It is within what pleases Jah. Now, Tafari, choosing the, the surname or the last name of Tafari, well, of course, it's only the elect. You understand? It's only the elect because the Rastafari today are likened to the, the Levi or the Leviticus, the Levites of yesterday. Now, how do we know this? Let's document it for a moment right here. Let's document this. Let's go to, um, I think it's uh, Hebrews, Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrew, Hebrew chapter. I like that. You like that? Hebrew. Yeah. Um, Hebrews. Yeah. I saw a Hebrew brother the other day. You know, because when we say Jew, it gets a little confusing because the confusers have confused it to that point of confusion. But. John leads us out of confusion here in Hebrews or Hebrews chapter 7. It speaks on the Melchizedek, the Melchizedek or the Melchizedek high priesthood is resumed. It speaks on the historic Melchizedek as a type of Moshiach, that Melchizedek or Melchizedek that Abraham gave tithes to of, of, of the booty. You understand the spoils of the battle. You understand? Yes, our ancestors threw down. You know, because they knew themselves. You understand? Our people are going through all this downpression because they don't know themselves and they don't know what is their true divine heritage or their divine rights. They're worshiping false gods or the true God, Jesus Christ and his father falsified by counterfeit Christianity and white supremacy, so forth and so on et al. Now, uh, Melchizedek high priesthood is greater than the Aaronic, is greater than Aaron's. So what we're learning about in the Torah portion, which is the basic, you know, says that the law, Torah, is our schoolmaster until Christ is come, until Christ be really formed in us until we come to that messianic level, which some call uh, Christian, but they have, um, they have watered down 
you know what I'm saying, and corrupted the true meaning of being a a, a follower of Christ or a Christian or, or Messiahite. But as we study the scripture, it puts everything into proper perspective. So here we're studying about Leviticus. Here we're studying about the ironic. We're studying about the template. You understand? The law is our schoolmaster. Until Christ now, until Christ in his kingly character become. You understand? But now understand this, that the reason that Melchizedek, the high priesthood, is greater than the ironic is because Aaron, remember Aaron and the golden calf incident? Aaron, mom of these pastors and preachers, they, they, they mean well, but sometimes they allow the foolishness of the people with Moses not there, and they go along with things that they should not. But because Aaron in Abraham, Aaron in Abraham paid tithes, paid Melchizedek tithes, gave him a tenth. So what they're saying is that Aaron actually paid tithes to Melchizedek in and through Abraham. So when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, it was actually Aaron who was in his DNA. Now get this, this is the level that the Bible is really speaking on. You see, but folks have dumbed it down, have super, super, superstitionized it, made it a superstition, not superstition, but a superstition, you know what I'm saying? And this is what causes Babylon, you know what I'm saying? This is what causes the confusion. Now, then here's the part I want to read from verse 11. And this section is called, it says, because the ironic priesthood made nothing perfect. So when we're studying this, we're getting the template of Jah's will. But we are not like the so-called foolish Jews who stop here and deny our black Lord and Savior. Yeshua HaMashiach, you understand? Um, and that's a very important point. That's a very, 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 that is so very, you know, that, that's, the, that's the Babylon deal breaker, you know? That, that, that's a deal breaker that will break their deal with the devil, that, that right there, you understand? That aspect of our black Lord and Savior. This is why whenever we speak about it, people are like, it doesn't really matter what color he was. So, so why you got this tear on the white pictures? Tell them it doesn't matter. And then maybe we'll, we'll be willing to, okay, reason with you without any, any, any pictorial, you understand, demonstration. But you want to throw this white supremacy on an already broken and downpressed people, then what do you think they're going to do? And you understand? They've been traumatized. They're suffering from PTSD, these black sheep. You understand? Post-traumatic slave disorder and dis-ease of their heart and their mind because of that original sin, because of ignosis or ignorance. They don't know, and the people that they trust in their society, from the past to the preacher and so forth and so on, don't tell them. Keeps them in that superstition, you know, keeps giving them less than half the story. Now, the ironic priesthood had made nothing perfect, but Aaron's priesthood was necessary to keep the seed, you know, keep, keep the seed until the Moshiach, you understand, know until the perfecter, our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua, the Lord of the karma, could come and wipe out and cancel out that bad debt. You understand? Know See, people talk about debt. What's your credit score? So forth and so on. Spiritually speaking, what is Babylon's credit score? If people thought about that and the debt collectors are coming, you know, <laughs> anyway, Verse 11 says, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, you understand, if perfection was by the Levitical priesthood, right, for under it the people received the law. See, it was under the Levitical priesthood. See, before they would have been in-laws if they had only kept their word. They said, whatever Jah say, we will obey. If they kept to that word and then go back to their idolatry, you understand, and their folly, then the Levitical priesthood would not have come on, you understand, and put a law upon them to keep them on the right track, you understand, until the, until the Messiah, until the seed, not seeds, but until that black seed could come forward, through which the Moshiach, our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua, could be born. What further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek 
and not be called after the order of Aaron. So he is asking the question, saying, well, if the people already got the, the law and everything, you know, through, through the, Levi the Levites, then what need was there? You know what I'm saying? What need, if, if perfection, if, if the completeness, if the fullness could come through that. But see, this is why we keep focusing on the fact that Leviticus only came about because of the golden calf incident. Because the Almighty said that it was his will that the whole nation the whole people would be a, a nation of the priesthood. Think about that. A nation of the priesthood. But they demonstrated their inability, you understand, to maintain even the patience of the Kedusan. Because as soon as Moses wasn't around for a while, they went back, back to their vomit and their mud and so forth and so on, to so their filthiness spiritually speaking, for, and probably otherwise too, but for the priesthood being changed. So the priesthood was changed. There is made of necessity a change also of the law. Because the priesthood was changed, there's also a, of necessity a change of the law. This is why we still study Torah, but we still remind you of the pure text of the Met of Kedus, of Negus and Negus. So, so you, you, you know what, what is going on here? According to the scripture, the priesthood was changed from Levi to who? Some of you already know this because you read this before and you're familiar with this, but please, Sima, Sima, here. For he of whom these things are spoken, he of whom these things are spoken, right, pertaineth to another tribe. So, so the one of whom these things were spoken was not of the tribe of the Levites or Lewi. It wasn't of Lewi Lejoch. It wasn't of the Lewawian, but was of another tribe. Which other tribe? It says, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Now, as we were speaking about the tabernacle, to get a clear picture of this in mind, that the only ones who could attend to the Masawiya or the Meshawiya, the altar, the brazen altar, you understand, um, 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 the the and Bebra is the Mizbe Mizbe the one that could pertain to that brazen altar where the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices came, was of the tribe of Levi. Nobody else could say, "Hey, I, I want to. I, I feel like being a priest. Let me go." No, 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 no. You couldn't do that. You understand? So. It says, for he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. There was no man at that altar who was of the tribe of Judah, basically is what it's saying. Because until it's Judah in the next verse, it says, for it is evident. There's no question, no doubt, you know. You don't have to do an investigation to prove it's true. You can investigate if you want, but it's already true. It's evident that our Lord, that our Adoni, our Adonai, Adonenu in the Hebrew, or Gitachin, Egzin, sprang out of Judah. That is evident that our, our Lord, our Master, sprang out of Judah, Yehuda, the praises of Yah, the praises of Jah, of which tribe Moses, Musa, our lawgiver, he spake nothing concerning priesthood. He didn't speak nothing. You could go and look look all through the, the Old Testament, uh, at least the Torah books, and you don't find any word where Moses said, yeah, and later on, uh, after it passes from Levi, then Judah is going to be the one, or, or Judah can attend and, and, and function the priesthood. No. Moses didn't speak nothing of that. Perhaps this could be what that conversation was taking place on Mount Tabor where Yeshua, he had transfigured himself, and, and Moses and Eliyahu were there. Moshe and Eliyahu were there, and they were conversing, and they were reasoning. Perhaps some of this is what they were discussing, too. You know what I'm saying? But it's interesting. Verse 15, and it is yet far more evident. So if that's evident, even this is more obvious. For that after the similitude. Now, similitude means the likeness. It means the parable. It means the, um, um, the, the simile, like a, like a hieroglyph. 
You understand? It, it's not so much just what the hieroglyph looks like, but it's really what that really means. It's an example of something. One can even say it's a mystery, but after the similitude of Malkes Edek, there arises another priest. So after the likeness, you understand, after the likeness of what? Of Melchizedek or Melchizedek, there arises, there, and the idea of arising has it within it the whole resurrection. Don't you get it? There arises what? Another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life, of an endless life, an eternal life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now that's interesting there, because what we find is that this is actually um, a quote, verse 17 of Hebrews chapter 7, is a quote from Psalm 110 and 4. Psalm 110 and 4. And now that's, that's, that's interesting. So we go to Psalm 110. Let's go to Psalm 110 for a moment. And verse, and verse, uh, verse 4. Psalm 110. Here we go. One ten, verse 4. It says, Yahweh hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, you know what this whole psalm is? You're probably familiar with it. Let's just go. It's only seven verses. Let's, let's deal with it. Psalm 110, it says, Yahweh. Well, let's, let's check out the English for a moment. Why the Hebrew is so important to really understand the context. Because we read it in the English, it says, The Lord said to my Lord, Oh, one is full caps, one is just capital first letter. Mm, Lord, Lord, right? That's how most folks from a Gentile Western misunderstanding. But now when we put it within the, the, the Hebraic, it would read more. Yahweh said to Adonai or Adoni. Yahweh said to Adoni, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So Yahweh said to Adoni, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand, at the right hand of Christ, Yeshua, resurrected, was seated at the what? The right hand of the Father, until I make thine enemies thy footstool, a place to put your feet, right? To step on them, basically. Yahweh shall send the rod of thy strength out of Sion out of Zion, the true Zion, our African Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now, I don't have to explain to you that there's much more in this verse. I mean, some people think it's just poetry. Oh, that's just Hebrew poetry. No, it's, it's, it's mysteries. You understand that those who are, as Christ says, it's to you, the disciples, was it given. It's not given to those. Those who were without, they just heard things as parables. They heard things in mythology. They just, they were dealing with mythologies. You understand? But those who were within, they were given the the comprehension of what the actuality of these mis mysteries or mythologies or parables were really about. So when folks be talking about mythology, they're on to something, but it's just so unfortunate that they are the ones outside. They'll be like, oh, this is a call text, so far and so on. No, it's just that if you're a disciple, you will know. If you're not, you're going to get all caught up on the parable. You're going to hear, but not really understand. You're going to see and all that, you know, you're, but not perceive and all that, right? But here it says, thy people shall be willing. His Majesty teaches about, about make our wills obedient to good influences. Thy people, not, not just black people, you understand, know or this kind of black folks. No, it says thy people, John's people. John's people shall be willing in the day of thy power.
power in the day and in the day of your hail, day of your power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. So what is the what is the womb of the morning? I mean, can the morning give birth? That's an interesting phrase, ain't it? Thou has the dew of thy youth. The dew isn't dew what comes up like in the early morning when you're in the country and stuff like that make everything wet until the sun come up and then it, it kind of goes dew of thy youth. Mm. Yahweh hath sworn. Now here's where the connect the, the connective is and will not repent. Will not change his mind. He, he hasn't done nothing wrong. You understand this? His will will be done. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Then it says, Adoni, at thy right hand. Notice what it says, Adoni. This is now what's very interesting. Notice how it's changing. Now it's saying that Adoni, or the Lord, remember it began with Yahweh saying to Adoni, or Egeziahir said to Gietaye. Right? Now, Notice this right here in verse 5. Adoni at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Is this speaking about the wrath of the Lamb? You understand? Is this speaking about the days to come? You know, the womb of the morning? Could that have something to do with some people who talk about that's a divination? That's not, you better look up what divination is. You know what I'm saying? John already says that it's written in the heavens. The heavens be a witness to his glory. It's not just bright lights. It goes deeper than that, you know. Um, but the children will recognize, you know. The children of obedience will get it. The children um, who are disobedient won't get it. But it says, he shall judge among the heathen, among the Goyim. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. You can say, John, John, do it now, right? He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. Therefore shall he lift up the rise. Now, that's just the fullness of that psalm, Psalm 110, the, the seven verses of that particular, um, that particular psalm. Now, there's an importance to Psalm 110. That's attested by the remarkable prominence that's given to it in the New Testament. In the New Testament, Geta, Geta Ye Jesus, Adoni Yeshua, he affirms, right, this psalm affirms the deity, the, the, the divinity of Yeshua, thus answering those who deny the full divine meaning of his New Testament Lord. Some say that Lord is just a title for anybody, but no, Adonai shows his divinity. And there's some verses here that it gives us in the Schofield Study Bible. It says that this psalm announces, it announces this psalm. Remember, it's David. Moses didn't speak nothing, but David did speak something, right? Tehuti spoke something. And this psalm, it announces the eternal priesthood of Mashiach, of Moshiach. One of the most important statements of the scriptures, the eternal priesthood of the Messiah, the eternal priesthood of Christ in his kingly character. Now, historically, the psalm begins with the ascension of Christ, when Christ ascended. Prophetically, the psalm or the mesmur, it looks on a to the time when Christ will appear as the rod of Jehovah's strength, the deliverer out of Zion. And we say this is fulfilled by Christ's kingly character, by Moa Ambesa, the Emineget of Yehuda, Kedamawi, Haile Selassie, Siyuma Egeziadiher, Negusa Neges, Ze Etiopia. Right? We say this is fulfilled. He is, he is the one with that rod. He represents that rod of Yahweh's strength. He knows the word strength, power, hyla, the deliverer out of Zion, Zion, the Ethiopian Zion, Ark of the Covenant, Beta Israel. So much proof and so much truth. But the heathen and the disobedient ones, they, the, the Kahadi, deniers deny, that's why we call them deniers. And the conversion of Israel, the conversion, when we look at the fact that because of that rod of Yahweh, 
Etymology, Hala Selassie, the whole Rastafari movement, the Ethiopian Hebrew movement, and so many other um, movements, you understand, and an awakening. It was a time of awakening from such a time, because that was the beginning of the true new age. The Gentiles don't know what they're doing. Don't follow them. Learn not the ways of the Gentile. B, to the judgment upon the Gentile power. So there's two things that's spoken about in the song. And I want to say, well, why was it speaking about this right now? Passover's coming up. Well, yeah, Passover, but we have to understand the reason for the season. It's a very important meaning in the reason for the season, right, that there's two things spoken about in this psalm. One, it looks forward to a time when Christ would appear as the rod of, of Jehovah's strength, the deliverer out of Zion, and there would be a conversion of Israel. This is not speaking of of Yeshua the Christ. It's not speaking of the Son, but it's speaking to Abba. It's speaking of the Elder. It's speaking of the Father. So the second part of this speaks about the judgment upon the Gentile world powers, which precedes the setting up of the kingdom. Now remember we began this off with the quote from the woman from the um, Khazarian conspiracy where she speaks about build your own nation. What's so special about, about D.C. And, and so forth and so on? Notice the lost sheep are still going down to Egypt. You understand? Because the pastors and the preachers, he didn't send them. That's why when you listen to them, they say nothing about what John said. They say nothing about the Bible. They don't represent the Bible. You understand? They don't represent God in spirit and in truth. That should be so obvious to you. But they have folks under superstition. You know what I'm saying? On, on, on the superstition. Because they don't want you to hear these things. They don't want you to learn these things, to pick up the Bible and start learning. See, when you start doing that, you become a problem for them. You know what I'm saying? You become a problem for them and for their masses. You see, their masses is not the Messiah. Because if their master was the Messiah, then they would tell you his words. They would speak his word for the situation that the people is going through. Because every situation of the Lord's sheep, the word, John's word, speaks to. So when these, these, these pastors and, 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 uh, and preachers of Balaamism, of Baal, when they come along, just listen to them. Listen to them. You understand? Know where is the word of John? Where is the word of God? You, you know what I mean? There is no word of God. So there's no, there, there's no light in them. You know, and and Jah already says that they come acting like they're in my name and they don't bring my word. He said, "Don't fear them. You know, they're they're they they're, they're, they're lucky that we, 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 the kingdom is not set up already because that's a death penalty for that. You know, straight up. You know, because see, it might sound cruel, but let's just trace the outcome. You understand? Because they keep the people in a sheeple state." And look at all the, the horrors, the miseries, the sorrows, the death and destruction that comes on the people because none of them, they'll hold this Bible up, they'll walk with this Bible clutch in their hand, but they won't open it. And if they do open it, they don't understand anything in it. And, they, and their leaders don't understand anything either. And you keep seeing where, where the highest crime, the murder, the death rate, all of this is happening in the same communities where they are, where, where, where they are countless number of churches, you know, but see, a lot of y'all are under so much superstition and a lot of others that they keep going to, even though they're not getting anything out of it, you know, it's, it's make-believe, they, they, they hype them, I, was, I like the music, ain't about that, ain't, ain't about the contemptible, the contemptible gad spell, ain't about that, you know, but see, there's a judgment that must happen upon the Gentile powers, now what are the Gentile powers? Would America be included in the Gentile powers? What do you think? Just be honest. What do you think? Do you think America would be included? Do you think the West, Europe and stuff? Do you think that what we're seeing happening within the economy and, and all the fear and phobia about what's happening and what to happen and the Freemasons and the bankers and the Illuminati and all of this, you think that's any part of the Gentile powers? What do you think? But there's a judgment upon the Gentile powers, which precedes, all this precedes the setting up of the kingdom. That is very, very significant. 
That is, and this is a messianic psalm. That's the next key thing about Psalm 110. Let's just return to where we were in Hebrews chapter 7. So reading it again, it says, For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Now, see, you got to understand this in context. It's not saying there is no law to be lawless like a lot of the so-called Christians who are falling from grace. They say they're in grace, but they're falling from grace. You see, because the master himself will say to them, I never knew you. Away from me, you works of iniquity, you lawless ones. You understand? But see, what it's speaking of here about a disannulling is speaking about those animal sacrifices, what we're, you know, what we're learning about here. But what we're learning about here is a basic principle. So what Christ shows is that for us, the animal sacrifices are a type. But our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua, even upon the cross, he fulfilled, he perfected that. So those are done away with as an actual practice, you know, killing animals. So would we support Peter? Yeah, we would support Peter, groups like Peter. You know what I mean? Because all of that is, there's, there's no divine will in the torture of the creation. And, I mean, look how they pollute, look how this earth is polluted. Look what's, look what's going on, y'all. All right, just stay blind, if you will. You know, you'll, you'll know the truth, you understand? You know, 19. For the law made nothing perfect. Now, see, we have to understand this into context. Remember, it's speaking about the Levites. And the Levites is a particular law concerning the practice of animal sacrifices. See, we want to make this clear. Because some might think, oh, we're reading this and we're studying this and we're talking about how this, we're learning from this. We're learning from the example of what did Christ fulfill. So what did that mean? So that Christ, we know that Yeshua is the Moshiach because he fulfilled the Old Testament types. But we can't just say that and not know that because then we're bearing false witness with liars. If we're saying it, you know, or you could believe it, well, we got the Bible, study it, find, find out the truth for yourself. So when it says the law in this context is speaking not about John's perfect will and intent that's embodied in the ten words of, the, of what's called the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue, but it's speaking about the Levitical um, law of sacrifices made nothing perfect. But the bringing in of a better hope, a better expectation did by the which we draw near to God. You see, even under the Old Testament um, sacrifices, only the priest, the high priest, one time a year that could even go into the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, into the presence of, of, of God, in other words. Now, when we look at the Ark in Ethiopia, it seems like they have gone backward instead of forward because only one priest, it seems like, can only do the same thing now, which is kind of key and significant. But... Yeshua has brought in a better hope by which we can draw near in spirit and in truth to God. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath. What it's saying is that the priest really didn't take an oath. This is what's key. And, you know, you don't think about that at first, but when you start to study it, the priest didn't take an oath, really. Notice that. Because they were Levites of a particular tribe and they didn't have an inheritance, therefore, this was their occupation among Israel, among the 12 tribes. But now we're saying that inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made a priest. Then explained a, a, a parenthetical in parentheses for those priests were made without an oath. They did not take a Sheba, a Sheba, you know what I'm saying? They did not take a, a what is it, a Sheba or a Shiva, an oath. They didn't take no oath. But this, speaking of Yeshua, with an oath by him that said to him, he took an oath by the one who said to him, 
Adoni Yahweh swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, it says, by so much was Yeshua made a surety. You know what a surety is? A pledge, a guarantee of a better, a better testament. Now, if we go just to the end of this chapter, next section, because the ironic priest died, Christos, Yeshua, the Moshiach lives forever. You see, the priests, because they were men and people, especially in that dispensation, you know, where death ruled and death reigned. Remember, it said that death reigned from Adam to Moses, but then the people, after coming out, they went backward to the old, you know, to the old cast out um, religion, we can say, you know, to the old thing that people are used to doing. And then they fell once again. So here it says, and they truly were many priests because they were not, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. They could not continue forever because they were not immortal. They were not eternal. Yeshua is immortal. Yeshua is eternal. But this man, notice it says, but this what? But this man, he came to reconcile, reconcile God and man. You understand? Know in and through himself in spirit and in truth. So when it says, but this man, because he continued ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. So the priesthood does not change again because perfection has been brought in. In other words, the systemic anomaly, the equation has been solved. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him. So Yeshua is able to save I and I to the uttermost, right, that come to God, Abba, even the Father, by way of him. We can't go around him. You say, oh, bypass him. You're saying we have to go to the Father, come to the Father by way of Yeshua. That's what we say in Yeshua's name. That's why his name was given a place and a prominence above every name that can be named in heaven and on earth. Notice that. That's significant. In that sense, even greater than the Father's name. You understand? Yet one is coming to God, who is the Father, must come through by him, by way of him, not to bypass him. So when you hear folks talk about, oh, there's many ways to get to God, no, and there's many ways to get to a lot of beings that call themselves God. You see what I'm saying? You know, there's many ways to get to many different kind of gods, but, but not to the true God. You know what I'm saying? Not to the true Father of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now, the part that we want to teach on, um, on Christ's sacrifice speaking about the Passover, the reason for the season. I think that this will this will make a good a good kind of intro into that. Because we like to get into a little more detailed explanation on certain matters that has become even clearer to us and we think we have the evidence or more evidence to present to ones and they can check it out and find the truth for themselves. Um, to continue right here it says um, Wherefore, he's able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God, ha Elohim, by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest, Kahin ha Gadol, Lik Kahinat, became, became us. He became us. He became as one of us. He took on our humanity. You know what I'm saying? Even, even our racial identity as Ethiopians, as black people, you know what I'm saying? The, the first people, the root people, you know, as death came in through one man, so that root race through, who, through, through whom all others came had to be saved. That's what proved both that black people are that root race, you know what I'm saying? That is as a parable as your Adam and Eve. Yovas, and that Christ also is black, because if he came through any of the byproducts, not through that pure seed, he could not, through, through, through him, deliver all 
others because he had to go back to the original place where the fault happened in order to correct it for everyone else who has come out of that DNA, out of that genome, from that, from that black dot, we can say, you know, and who have, by whatever shades of separation, even by the sixth degree of, of separation from the melanin, which is the Gentile or the white man, in other words, for such an high priest became us, who was holy, set apart, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That's a deep statement right there. Made, you know, it takes you a while to even think, made higher than the heavens, right? But then if you look at the context of it, you know, you will, you will seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orient, because that is higher than the heavens, if you understand the context of this. But that, too, is a point that requires a little more teaching and, and, and presentation on. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer sacrifice. Imagine that. The high priests and the priests, they needed daily to make sacrifice. Think about all of those animals that were being offered for sacrifice. I know that would be like, wow, look at those Hebrews, man. That's why I don't do those. That's, but think about it. Look how many animals are being sacrificed for what today? For your hunger? You understand? Because you like eating betters? Or is there something more nefarious going on that you just don't know? Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, 